Morning, brothers and sisters. Morning, Chief. And welcome back home. <laughs> who, who feels like that this morning? Home is a place where you are yourself. Home is a place where you are surrounded by those you love and those that love you. And I'm confident to say, welcome back home. Because we do love you. And we know that you love us. Is really all of us together. We do love ourselves. So today our Psalm will be Psalm 23. I'm sure we all got to learn this Psalm when we were kids. So can we stand up and we'll read as usual. The Lord is my shepherd. I have all oh. that I need. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. He renews my strength. He guides me along right paths, bringing me honor to his name. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will, I will not be afraid, for you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. You prepare the feast for me in the presence of my enemies. You honor me by anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessings. All of us together. Surely, your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. My sister Kay will come for us to do the doxology. <laughs> Good morning. Let's go. Okay. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him, my God, the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Amen. <laughs> so we'll remain standing as we sing along to the goodness of God. <laughs> I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. And all my days I've been held in your head. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, oh, I will sing of the goodness. Of God. Of 
Let us pray. Oh God, we give you thanks that you sent Jesus to guide us in your way of truth and life. Help us to listen to his voice and follow him faithfully as you have followed us faithfully. Teach us to show welcome to all the members of the flock you draw here into your fold. Show us how to devote our lives to the service of the gospel, to your good news. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. We do have some announcements. I don't know if there's any lunches downstairs, and I see some thumbs up. Kathy and Dave made them up. That's what I figured. That's all right. So there are to go lunches downstairs. Uh, if you would like to take some with you for yourself, for your neighbor, for the person standing on the sidewalk who needs a meal, feel free to do that. We we'll just go downstairs and grab a few. Uh, there was breakfast this morning, I know, because I brought it in. <laughs> All right. And uh, so I, I, and uh, there will be breakfast uh, next week of some sort. Uh, and uh, you are welcome to come uh, starting around 915-ish and then uh, head up here for worship service afterwards. Uh, come for fellowship of food, conversation, uh, both. If you want to keep up to date with the activities, you can do that on eastdaytonfellowship.org. And along the top, hit the calendar, and you'll be uh, taken to a list of the events for this week. And if you want to be on the uh, phone call message list uh, of either uh, for prayer opportunities throughout the week or of any changes in our schedule, uh, let myself or Zach know, and we'll get you on that list. Every Wednesday from 12.30 to 1.30, prayer is uh, offered here in the church. It's a time of a group of people will gather and pray for our needs in the sanctuary. And then Wednesday evenings in the back room is uh, the small group Bible study. And then on Thursdays from 12.30 to 1.30, another prayer opportunity. This one is done walking the neighborhood and praying for our community. Start here at the church, so that's where you'd show up if you want to participate, and then walk around in the neighborhood. All three of those events, the two prayer opportunities and the Bible study, you may come and go as you please. If you haven't been here ever on any of those, you're welcome. If you've been here once or twice, but not for a while, you are welcome to come to those events. You do not have to come continuously to be a part of those.
Fridays are the opportunity for, for you to help out uh, as we work down in the basement alongside the Food for the Journey folks who serve hundreds of meals out of our parking lot. If you'd want to come help us downstairs with the clothing and other items, uh, you can start at 1030, go to about uh, 130 to start cleaning up. We also have opportunities Tuesday. We Tuesday. are doing that this week. Yes. Yep. All right. Other opportunities to help, and this is during a less crowded time, if you want to help with downstairs with clothing or other uh, tasks that need done downstairs, you can show up Tuesday at 4 o'clock or Wednesday at 10 o'clock. <laughs> you have something to say? Oh, on that, oh, okay. I'm going to let people know what the clothes closet looked like back then. That picture where you had the clothes. Is it on there? there? Right there. Ah, right. so That's if you good. see behind behind the orange tent, some people standing around and in, in, in near the garage, that was our clothes closet three years ago. Is that right? That was everything. That was everything. So three years ago, we put set up tables, put ta clothes on the table and said, here's your clothes closet. So those of you who have seen, seen the downstairs, that is the growth, the explosive growth that has happened due to lots of volunteer work. Um, and then I believe that was our food pantry also. The one tables had food on them. That was our food pantry also. Yeah. Those tables behind the orange tent. So within three years, explosion. And uh, not because we wanted to, but because the need exploded. The need became apparent. And that is the reason we said we've got to do something else. Yes, thank you. We need to do something else. And then I get a call saying a, a uh, clothing uh, thrift store wanted to give us all their inventory. God provided. A weekend, next weekend, this weekend coming up, starting Friday evening, um, although there will be activity during, the fri during, tri during Friday afternoon as well, is the Brethren in Christ Great Lakes Conference annual meeting here in this church. People from possibly seven states could be coming here Friday evening and on Saturday for this conference. You are welcome to attend any part of that. Um, Friday evening is a worship service. That worship service starts at seven. Um, and then Saturday from nine to three is the conference. A, a special part you might be interested if you just wanted to show up for part of it. It's Saturday at 10 o'clock. They're from 10 to 11. Uh, the staff of, of this uh, congregation, so it's Zach, myself, Chi, and Dami, will be sharing some stories of East Dayton Fellowship you might be interested in hearing. But feel free to come for any of it. Um, it's going to be a busy place here Friday and Saturday. Uh, as I said, Friday is the worship service at 7 we would like after that to offer desserts to those who are coming to that worship service. So we are asking if anyone would like to make or bring some desserts to share, to bring those on Friday, anytime in the afternoon by seven. Okay, just downstairs, some desserts to share with others. And have them tell me that they're coming uh, to do that. That way I'll have a mental count and can and let Zach know you're going to do that so he'll have an idea about how much has been is going to come and if he needs to make plans and tap some shoulders for some other staff. Um, yeah, so let Zach know that. Um, also, this a uh, stewards deacons meeting is happening right after worship service. Uh, you know, give maybe five minutes. It'll be back in that room today. Stewards and deacons. Right. We've come to our time of offering and time of offering of ourselves. This is what we know about God's love. 
that Jesus laid down his life for us. And we are called to lay down our lives for one another. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and seeing another person in need refuses to help them? I don't, I'm not going to answer that question. <laughs> Except that then I encourage us to love as Jesus loves. Letting us put our faith into action by offering our lives to the Lord. Offering our lives to the Lord looks different for each person, depending on the resources they have. So for some, it may be offering a financial gift into the offering plate at his past. For some, it may be lifting up a prayer uh, during this time or writing a prayer or a praise or concern on a card that's in the back of the pew and placing that in the offering plate. Offering yourselves may be volunteering during the week in one of those opportunities. Only you know how you can offer yourself to God. Let us pray for the offerings we are about to receive. O oh God, as we bring our offerings, which are symbols of the power of this world, infuse in them the power of your world, the power of love. Through your blessing and our willingness to share, may these offerings become a source for hope and love in this church family and in the community beyond us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would the ushers please come forward? Still my soul, the Lord is on thy side Bear patiently the cross of grief or pain Leave to thy God to order and provide In every change he faithful will be still my soul, thy best, thy heavenly friend, through thorny ways leads to a joyful end. Be still my soul, thy God doth undertake to guide the future as he has the Still my soul when change and
church there's morning there's times i hate to come up after something like that and break the beauty of the message like that but i'm going to read for us some scripture that also contains truth and beauty for all of us and that rest and that hope you find that you find that after jesus finds you when I found out he loved me, uh, it didn't like immediately change all my circumstances, but it changed the entire world and the universe because I knew that the creator of this universe loved me, which I thought was impossible because of the darkness that I'd lived in. So wherever you come from or whatever's going on in your life, just know he's right there. He's next to you. He's got his arm around you. He's loving you. And he just wants you to turn to him. That's it. Let me read this bit of scripture. While Peter and John were speaking to the people, they were confronted by the priests, the captain of the temple guard, and some of the Sadducees. These leaders were very disturbed that Peter and John were teaching the people that through Jesus, there is resurrection of the dead. They arrested them, and since, and since it was already evening, put them in jail until morning. But many of the people who heard their message believed it. So the number of men who believed now totaled about 5,000. The next day, the council of all the rulers and elders and teachers of religious law met in Jerusalem. And that Annas, the high priest, was there, along with Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and other relatives of the high priest. They brought in the two disciples and demanded, by what power or in whose name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of our people, are we being questioned today because we've done a good deed for a crippled man that they had just healed? Do you want to know how he was healed? Let me clearly state to all of you and to all the people of Israel that he was healed by the powerful name of Jesus the Christ, the Nazarene, the man you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead. For Jesus is the one referred to in the scriptures where it says, the stone that you builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. Amen. Amen. Yes. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning, gentle ladies and men. <laughs> yeah, so I have um, scriptural passage um, memory verse for this week is up there. I've tried to uh, 
have my thoughts written down. So that's <laughs> <laughs> so let's go together. We'll first of all uh, mention the passage and then we'll say together we'll do that twice. So one, two, go. Acts 4, 12. There is no nation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. One more time. Acts 4, 12. There is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. Yeah, amen. Don't forget that part of the purpose of this is that we actually memorize this passage. We we think through it throughout the week, you know, and let the scriptures, you know, um, soak inside us. It's very important because we live in a world that's becoming more and more diverse, which is good, you know, uh, but we're also living in a world that wants you to accept that there is no truth, that truth can be defined by your own feelings, by your own thoughts, by the things you believe. So you have your truth, I have my truth, everybody. So there are 8 billion truths in the world. But Jesus is saying here, or, or, or you know, uh, I think Peter, that there is salvation in no one else. As he says, God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. In John chapter 14, verse 16, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, that no one comes to the Father but by me or through me. So without Jesus, nobody comes to the Father. You can read about so many other religions. There is no other religion that gives that finality as, as as far as salvation is concerned you know i have to you know quick you know uh the, the i think the analects of of um uh the founder of taoism confucius you know uh c.s lewis says he he completed that part you know at the end he says something like this is the tao t-a-o so this is the tao I do not know if anybody has been able to observe it. So you can imagine somebody writes a whole whatever and says, well, this is, this is how you should live, but I do not know if anybody has been able to observe it. Tao means way. Yes. Yeah. So he writes his way, but no, he, he says, well, this is how you should live, but I don't know if anybody has been able to live that way. Or... The founder of Islam, who says, I do not know where I am going. You know, so after all said and done, but Jesus says, I know where I am going, and you are following me to where I am headed to. So let's, let's be convinced about who Jesus says he is, uh, because that's the first step to getting help from God, to realize that we are completely helpless and that Jesus can help us because he has the power to help us, to change us, even if that change is gradual. Uh, we will not wait till we are perfect. I've not seen any perfect person apart from myself. <laughs> ask, ask my wife. <laughs> you know, we're not waiting till we are perfect. But we also have the responsibility not only to believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, but also to tell others that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Sometimes we say to ourselves, well, I, I still have this challenge. How can I tell my neighbor about Jesus? You know, I remember a comic book I read many years back. It's, it's about the Incredible Hulk. You know, this particular, um, this particular uh, volume of the comic, issue of the comic, is titled, Half a Hulk is Better Than None. So one of the bad guys changed Hulk, that he was part Hulk, very powerful, and part Bruce Banner. So he wasn't fully Hulk. 
He didn't have all the powers that comes with his anger, you know. But, you know, through that, because he was still, he still had half of what he was, he was able to defeat the enemy. That's how we are. We are not what we should be yet. We are becoming what Jesus is making us gradually. But we can look back at our lives a year ago, five years, 10, 15 years ago, and see that there is progress, even if it is gradual. We know that there is a falling and a rising and a falling and a rising. But God has not given up on us. We have not given up on ourselves. We may be half a hulk. We may be half of what we are, but we also have the responsibility to tell others that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody goes to the Father but through him. Let it soak into our hearts throughout this week. And when that happens, God will grant us the grace to be witnesses, imperfect witnesses, though we may be. Thank you. All right, brothers and sisters. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I thought it's a good thing. It's a good thing. All right. This is the, I was going to say captain. <laughs> That's not the right analogy. This is the, the guy that blathers at Peter. Um, calling you back. Well, we we really have proclaimed good news to each other this morning. And so I'm mindful of that. Uh, you don't need me to, to, to blather and blather. So I'm, I'm going to try to be conscious of that as I, as I preach. Um, you, we are all preachers in this church. We are all proclaimers and ministers. And, and we were taking time to do that for one another. And, um, and that's one of the things that I like about our church family. Um, so we're in a, a kind of between time in terms of uh, sermon series. Uh, in uh, May, I'll begin a different series, a connected kind of topical series of sermons. Right now, I'm just preaching on what are called the lectionary texts. And that is like a reading plan that lots of different Christian denominations follow. Um, and it kind of selects different different uh, texts for us. And so I'm, I'm just following that. And it has us in a lot of uh, First John uh, these days. And we're in First John today. Uh, Starting at chapter 3, verse 11, I want to read that for you. And then, uh, and then there's some more in that chapter we're going to read. But 1 John 3, 11 says this. This is the message you have heard from the beginning. We should love one another. John, if you know anything about his gospel or about these epistles written uh, by him, this is a, a very important theme to him. <laughs> Uh, Jesus in the Gospel of John, and then John discussing Jesus in the, in the three epistles, first, second, third. Love is at the heart of the message. This is the truth that we have seen in him, John begins that letter with. But of course, a question does follow that immediately. What does that love entail? What is love? baby, don't hurt me. <laughs> don't hurt me. No more. Uh, you guys know, okay, it's a really lame joke and I couldn't resist it. Um, uh, there's a song, if you don't know the song. But it, what is love? That's like actually not an idle question because it turns out that a lot of twisted stuff has been done in the name of love. Boy, I... I bet you I don't need to illustrate this too much for you. I have seen relationships, romantic relationships, uh, but friendships, parental child relationships. I've been in some of these. <laughs> I bet you have too. Where things are being done in the name of love, or persons are claiming they're doing them and that they, the motivation is loving or whatever, and it's just twisted and messed up and like weird and and and. And yet they say, well, that's, that's what love is. And this is so true, in fact, that if you, if you look at different people and you, you ask them about love and what it is and what you think it entails, 
you, you can get such different pictures of what love is and such different pictures of what is entailed in loving someone. And the word has been used so variously that I've even met uh, like uh, thinkers, theologians. I, I met one in particular who said, I've given up on the term. I, I think I don't think it's a useful term. Uh, this this theologian I was speaking to uh, was saying this. Um, that sure is a pretty humongous theme in the New Testament. It sure is a word that's on the lips of Jesus and on and in John. And so I think it's a very useful word. But it turns out that the word alone is not enough. The fact that there are many counterfeit loves does not mean there isn't something that is the genuine article. In fact, the greater the good, the more numerous and terrible will be the counterfeits of that good thing. When, when there are good things in this world, <clears throat> the enemy loves to create counterfeits of it. In fact, one way to understand what evil itself is, what sin itself is, is just making cruddy counterfeits of the good. You think about, you think about any kind of sinful motivation and what does it boil down to? Well, it boils down to something that could be a desire for the good that got shot in a, in a bad direction, right? Um, that, um, that actually that no human being ever does anything other than for reasons of love. It's just that our loves get disordered or they get sick and misshapen. So a love can be disordered when I put loves in the wrong order. I've used this example before, but I love my daughter and I love chocolate ice cream. And the other night, saint that I am, there was only a little bit of chocolate ice cream left. And I did not then go... Sorry, Junie. <laughs> I, I said, okay, Junie, like here, you know, here, here it is, you know, um, which was the right call. Uh, and that's a silly example, but right, like chocolate ice cream is a, is a good thing. Like truly, praise God, that's a good thing, right? But if I were to love chocolate ice cream more than my daughter, that would be suddenly be bad. So it's not that chocolate ice cream is bad, but that my, my love for it, if it's disordered, if it's out of order, it can lead to something bad, right? Or like the desire for um, pain relief or for physical comfort. That's a good thing. Our bodies are good and they're, they're not made to be put into pain. But if I love my own physical comfort and my own bodily integrity more than I love my neighbor, or I love the health and, and integrity of my body. And I pursue that over other things. Why then all of a sudden I can, I can ruin the very body that I was seeking to provide comfort to. So many addiction stories begin that way. Pain, you're not meant to love pain. You're meant to love your body. And, to, and, and it's not wrong to seek the comfort of the body. But like, you see what I'm saying? So, so there's this whole way of thinking about sin and evil in, 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 in our faith that says, you know, what evil is is just counterfeiting of good things. Because God made a world that's good. Where does evil come from? It's not its own independent entity. What evil is is simply um, good things that got misshapen or loves for good things that got misshapen in disorder. Well, so love itself is, is the highest good because God is love. And so it would make sense that there are a great number of terrible counterfeits that go by that name, which then does leave us with the question, well, how do you know the genuine article? How can you decide what love really is and what it looks like in your life? How do I know how to love God and love my neighbor? And, well, let's read a little bit further. Pick up with me in verse 16 of John chapter 3, and I'm going to read through verse 24. We know what real love is because Jesus gave up his life for us. So we also ought to give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. If someone has enough money to live well and sees a brother or sister in need, but shows no compassion, how can God's love be in that person? Dear children, let's not merely say, that we love each other. 
Let us show the truth by our actions. Our actions will show that we belong to the truth. So we will be confident when we stand before God. Even if we feel guilty, God is greater than our feelings. And he knows everything. Dear friends, if we don't feel guilty, we can come to God with bold confidence. And we will receive from him whatever we ask because we obey him and do the things that please him. And this is his commandment. We must believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us. Those who obey God's commandments remain in fellowship with him and he with them. And we know he lives in us because the spirit he gave lives in us. Brothers and sisters, Jesus, in the way he lived, in what he taught, and ultimately in the way he died and rose again, Jesus shows us what love really is. There are a million counterfeits. And sometimes, actually, people will come to Jesus if you come later in life to Jesus. You, you can grow up with an understanding of love where someone tells you God is love. But you've grown up in a home where, and I know a family where this is true, that the, the mom gave her son meth when he was eight years old and sold that son on the, these streets. Yeah, you know who I'm talking about. Okay, now in that family, and they say, I love you. And, and, and there's this whole thing about like, we stick together as a family and, and I love you and you love me, but now go out there and, and, you know, get the family some money on the streets and here's medicine for you and give you meth. Okay, now if you grow up and that's how you understand love and someone says God is love, you all of a sudden are actually going to believe a lie because even though that, that phrase is true with the right understanding, they don't have the right understanding. So where do we look to find what love is? We look to Jesus, and Jesus shows us a few things. And I'm, we could talk for many sermons about this, but I'm going to highlight just a couple today. The first thing that that passage highlights for us about the nature of true love, the nature of love as Jesus shows it to us, is that it goes beyond mere words to take costly material shape in what we do. So Jesus did not just talk a good game about love. This is one error. Love can be a word that we that is a shallow word. It can mean that I feel well disposed towards you, that I feel affectionate towards you. And that's good. In fact, that's a thing even scripture talks about that. It says outdo one another in showing affection for one another. So affection is good. Feelings of affection are good, but that's not love. Love, as we see it in Jesus, is not about words. It's not even about feelings of affection or words that express those. It's shown in the fact that he gave his life for us. That it cost him and it shaped his life. It changed his direction. It, 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 it determined what he did. Can I say that I love? God or love my neighbor or love my brother or love my sister if my life is not different because of that love. It doesn't affect where I work. It doesn't affect how I spend my time. It doesn't affect whether or not I let myself be interrupted. It doesn't affect how I speak because that is part of it. Everything Jesus said and everything he did, and who he spent his time with, and how he spent that time, it was all what it was because he is love incarnate. He is showing us care for others. And so brothers and sisters, as this scripture says, let us not love in words alone, right? But let us show the truth in our actions. That's the first thing we've got to know about love. Love, if it is not embodied, if it isn't material, if it doesn't change where you are, what you say, what you do, how you spend your money, how you spend your time, who you hang out with, and what you do together, if it doesn't change those things, then it isn't the love of God. It's a counterfeit, a cheapo one, 
some counterfeits are cheapo and some are like expensive. Like, wow, the cheapo counterfeit is the stuff where it's just at the level of words, just at the level of feelings of affection or whatever. Now, that's true. It is costly. It changes our lives. But here's another thing that's also true. True love, as Jesus reveals it, is never coerced or manipulated. It is free and freely given. Here's something else from John that I want to read you, okay? This is uh, from the Gospel of John, uh, chapter uh, 10. Let me get to the right page. Chapter 10, starting at verse 17. This is what Jesus says. The Father loves me because I sacrifice my life, that I may take it back up again. No one can take my life from me. I sacrifice it voluntarily. For I have the authority to lay it down when I want and the authority to take it up again. For that is what my father has commanded. Jesus thought that it was important that you and I understand that he was choosing that from a place of freedom and authority to lay his life down for you and I. He was not coerced into it. He wasn't manipulated into it. He wasn't being arm twisted into it. He had a position of strength and authority and freedom and integrity. And he used his strength, his authority, his freedom, and his integrity to voluntarily surrender his life for you and I. It cost him, it shaped his life, but it was free and freely chosen. One form that counterfeit love takes comes from abusive, codependent, and just plain old wicked sources that use the language of love to betray its source. Abusive spouses say, I, I, I love you, don't you love me? C come back, right? I know I hit you again, and I said I wouldn't hit you, and then I hit you again, and I said I wouldn't hit you, and I hit you again, and I said I wouldn't hit you, but I love you. Don't you love me? That don't you love me? Don't you love God? Don't you love this? Don't you love that? And then that, that love is used as a cudgel, as a tool to manipulate and control. I mean, there are like stark examples of that, like the one I was sharing earlier about the family on Third Street, where you, you love the family, right? You love me, your mother, right? So you're going to do this, right? that's an abusive situation there. There are codependent versions. There's just plain old wicked versions of this where people use the language of love to manipulate other people. But that is not the love of Christ. This, that's why Jesus takes the time to share this. I have the authority over my own life and I lay it down freely and I take it up again freely. That is such an important point both of these errors are possible. The error of, uh, oh, go be warm and well-fed and love costs you nothing. But then the other, I, you do see this a lot. You see abusive and codependent relationships a lot. I'm, I'm a pastor, guys, and so I have lots of conversations with individuals. And I keep using this, this term, codependency. Have you ever, I, I need, probably need to say something about that. Who knows that term, codependency? Okay, we're, at, we're a church that has lots of people that have addiction history and are in recovery. <laughs> so it shouldn't surprise me that a lot of you know what that word is because it's one that gets covered, right? But in case you're not familiar, there's a few hands that didn't go up. In a codependent relationship, you have a dynamic where there's a person that's primarily in a taking role and a person primarily in a giving role. And they both need those roles. The taker has not learned to stand on their own two feet and they fear they can't, or by habituation, they're kind of lazy. I mean, that happens. And it's convenient to them and helpful to them to have someone who will just give them and give them and give them and bail them out and bail them out and bail them out. And the giver in the situation needs it too, because their sense of worth, their sense of dignity, their sense of, uh, of being a person comes from having a role where they can uh, 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 be the one that is giving. And they think that they'll be a bad person if I don't give. They'll, they'll say, uh, well, I'll be a bad person. I'll be a bad Christian if this person I love needs a thing and I don't give it to them. I mean, didn't didn't scripture say that if I see someone in need, I need to help them? So I can't, I can't ever say no. Well, yes, you can. Jesus said no a lot. Did you ever see this in scripture where Jesus 
there there will be people that want Jesus to do X, Y, Z, and he'll say no. Or where Jesus helps one person, but there are many others that didn't get help. That that happens on several occasions. He goes to the the, the pool at Bethsaida, and there's sick people all around, and he heals this one woman. And then that's it. And there's still a lot of sick people there. Not every person. And and Jesus was a human being. He was the son of God in the flesh, but he was a human being. And he and he actually told his disciples, we had a we had a retreat at this church ages ago. And we quoted Jesus where he's giving instructions to his disciples. And he says, um, if anyone greets you and tries to stop you on the road, don't let them. Walk on by them. You're on you're on mission with me. Do you guys remember this? Those of you that were at that retreat, I know mom and dad, you were here then. This was like six or seven years ago. Um, and we were saying that Jesus gives us permission when he has given us a focus, a thing to do, that it is okay to say no to something else or somebody else that pops up and, 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 and says, you've got to do X, Y, Z for me right now. It isn't necessarily loving because it isn't necessarily healthy to let other people dictate to you how you have to spend your time. Love is from a position of autonomy and integrity laying down various freedoms and various goods and, and even your own body for someone else. It is not someone comes to you and says, um, hey, um, uh, this is an analogy I, I was given by, by a friend when I was in school. It says, imagine you, you meet someone on a, on a bridge. Say hello, you exchange some pleasantries and they're carrying a big, big rope with an anchor and they're just lugging this thing over the bridge. And they say, um, hey, um, can you hold this for me for a minute? Okay. You grab hold of that anchor and the coiled rope and like, great, stand right there. Da, 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 and they tie the rope around their waist and they get up onto the ledge and they jump off. <laughs> yeah, and you're you're holding on to the anchor and they're dangling below. And and and, and they're like, okay, you, you gotta you, you gotta save me, you gotta hold on to me. Like, what? <laughs> I did, what? I do? I did, how did this happen, right? Well, climb up. No, sorry. You got you to hoist me up. Have you ever been in a situation like that? Well, I'm not saying just cut the rope right away, but I am saying there may come a time where if that person is about to drag you and them under and they will not climb up and they were the one that threw themselves off the bridge, that you aren't God. And that wasn't right or healthy of them. And there might come a day where you got to say, you need to climb up right now because my strength is about to fail and I cannot hoist you up. And if you won't climb up, I will have to let go. That is not unloving to get to that point. Love is complicated, isn't it? It's a four letter word. It's short. It's one syllable. It's actually really hard to do which is why it matters so much that we have Jesus to look at. You need to be saturated in the Gospels. You need to read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you need to read them again, and then you need to read them again. And you need to look at where Jesus draws boundaries, where Jesus confronts, where Jesus sometimes expresses anger, where Jesus sometimes says no, where he says yes. You need to look at him and know that what you see in him is love. He is your North Star. He will show you what it is to love. It's not codependency. It's not always saying yes and then feeling guilty. Because here's the other thing. True love doesn't always feel good. And it can can feel bad for a couple reasons. One, it can feel bad because it does cost. The cross hurt a lot. And to lay yourself down, to sacrifice for somebody else, to go that mile... We're having to walk a bit of a tightrope here. A tightrope's not the image. We're following Jesus. He says, the way is narrow. Follow me. And you can err in a big way on either side. You can err by not being willing to pay the cost. By having cheap love cheaply bought. Love will cost you everything. It will pay. It will hurt. It will be hard work. It will it will go on. You will have to endure. It will be patient work that doesn't resolve quickly. Love is hard. But it's also not this codependent, abusive stuff either, right? So, so you're following Jesus. And so it can it cannot feel good because it's costly, because it hurts, because you're giving of yourself. That's one way it cannot feel good. But this other thing, now this is really profound. 
John is talking in this passage, and he says, our actions will show we belong to the truth. So we will be confident when we stand before God, even if we feel guilty, God is greater than our feelings. He's saying you can be living a loving life, a Christ-like life, and have false guilt. False guilt. Not all guilt is a, a sign of repentance or, or piety. Like sometimes we will be convicted of sin and we might feel a guilty feeling. And that might be the spirit trying to convict us of sin. But you can have false guilt. And John's talking about that here, that you are living a loving life, but you feel guilty because because maybe you got to that point in, 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 in a walk with someone where you said, I've got to let go. You, you've got, you, either you start pulling or I'm not going to make it with you and I'm going to have to let go. And you've had to do that. And, but then you feel horribly guilty. You're like, oh no, did I, did I do the wrong thing? Well, A, boy, it's a good sign if you're struggling with that because it shows you're engaged. It shows you care. But B, don't judge the situation by how you feel about it. Maybe you did screw up. Maybe you cut someone loose too soon or too perfunctorily. It's possible. Sometimes you can air that way. But maybe you didn't. Maybe when you got to that point and you cut that person off or you or you drew a boundary, that was absolutely a loving thing to do. And your guilt is false. It's from the enemy. He's trying to shame you. He's trying to get you uh, discombobulated. And, and that guilt has nothing to do with God. It's, it's false guilt. Again, Jesus has to be our North Star in this. Your actions will show. Use the life of Christ. Use his way of living and talking as that barometer. And do that with other Christians. I am a horrible evaluator of my own living. And you are a horrible evaluator of your own living. This is why we need the church. You need people that know you well enough and that, 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 that you know well enough that you can, you, can, you can talk shop. Jesus is the teacher of a craft of life. He's the teacher of a way of life, right? He is the way. And so you need to be able to talk shop, life shop with other people. And say, so, okay, here's the issue. I've got this person in my life and we've gone through X, Y, Z. And, but, and I do this with, with people. I do this with staff. There's a, there was a situation where I was relaying information. And, and like, am, am I, do I need to draw a line here? Do I, need to, do I need to keep engaging with this person? What do I need to do? And, um, and so we need that because you, when you're in the thick of it yourself, you can't tell. So you need the barometer to be Jesus's life and your life. Don't compare feelings. Look at actions. Look at your life. Does it look like Jesus? Does, does what you're doing look like what Jesus did? And then bring other people into that to help you evaluate. And then accept the answer that, no, you didn't do anything wrong. And then know if the guilt comes up, it's false guilt. Condemn it. Say, Satan, not today. <laughs> I'm not condemned. I'm covered. And if you are convicted, know that you are covered in grace, even in your screw up, that God's love can make your lack of love right. And then it can be okay. But I want to end on this. He says that even if we feel guilty, God is greater than our feelings. He knows everything. Dear friends, if we, have, uh, uh, if we don't feel guilty, we can come to God with bold confidence and receive from him whatever we ask for. Um, and so, brothers and sisters, with Jesus' life as our model, with his spirit alive in us, our Father's love can bring peace to our hearts. He can, he can bring integrity to the way we live. We can walk with integrity as Christians, which means walking in love, and he can bring peace to our hearts. Not, not in the face of, but through those, that, that maelstrom of other feelings. He is greater than our hearts, greater than our feelings. This love, the love of God, that is meant to lead our lives, that is meant to pacify our hearts, that is meant to shape how we live. This love comes to us first as people in need of it. I can only love because he first loved me. Only one who has realized that at your worst moment, you were still the apple of God's eye. Only one who has known that whether you feel it to be true or not right now, that's not that's immaterial. Only one who has come to know and trust that and is willing to live on the basis of that, that 
is what matters. The love of God is what matters. That love modeled for us in the life of Jesus. That love is a living reality in our spirits as the Holy Spirit inhabits our spirit. And that love as the active presence of the God who is love in our lives. His love will help us love. And so I want to conclude by singing about his love. Not mine, not yours, his love. Oh, how he loves you and me. Now, she and Dami did have to leave early because they had to go and, and pick up friends. I'm still tempted to try to lead this live because I'd rather sing an acapella with you, my brothers and sisters, than I would with a recording. Can I bug Debbie and Kay and anyone else to come up that feels like you want to help sing? Can you come up here and get up here with me and help me sing, Oh, How He Loves You and Me? This is an old favorite of him. And so if you don't know it, you'll catch on quickly because it's real easy to catch on to. And I think what we'll do, Susan, is we'll sing slide one, slide two, and then maybe sing slide one once more. Verse one, verse two, and verse one once more. And you guys come right on up here. So I need help. I'm going to do, I'm going to try to peg myself to you guys because you have better voices than me. <laughs> come on up. Come on up. I want you guys to stand on up. <laughs> you, once we start, you'll know it. Okay. And um, if you know it out there, sing out, okay? It's his love that will give us the ability to love. All right. Oh, how he loves you and me. Oh, how he loves you and me. He gave his love. What more could he give? Oh, how he loves you. Oh, how he loves me. Oh, how he loves you and me. Second verse. Jesus to Calvary did go, his love for sinners to show, what he did there, from these things. Oh, how he loves you, oh, how he loves me, oh, how he loves you and me. One more time on that first verse to close. Oh, how he loves you and me. Oh, how he loves you and me. He gave his life and he gave. Oh, how he loves you. Oh, how he loves me. Oh, how he loves you and me. Amen. Because he loves, we can love. Follow him. Model yourself on him. His love will change you on the inside, pacify your heart, and empower you to love as he loves. Go forth in his peace, confident of his love for you. Deacons and stewards, I'll see you in five minutes in the back. God bless you as you go. <laughs> oh, oh yeah, I'll show you. Yeah,